Hello, everyone, and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Paula Kerr, a Client Relationship Manager here at SPAC Enterprise, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Today, we're discussing how to review site plans from a transportation perspective. Now, before we continue, we want you to join the conversation. For those that have been here for a while, uh, sitting here waiting for the webinar to come in, I've been saying, comment, get us your questions, get us your concerns, and please use that chat box or the Q&A. And we'll either try to discuss it immediately or circle back at the end. And you can always email Mike or myself if you think of, of a question later. The Traffic Corner Tuesday webinar series is brought to you by Mike on Traffic, which is part of the SPAC Enterprise family of companies. SPAC Enterprise consists of a group of traffic engineering companies focused on helping you create healthy transportation systems and fix broken ones. So please visit our websites, countycars.com or spacconsulting.com to schedule your consult call and discuss your needs. Whether it be a transportation equipment to traffic counting to engineering studies, we want to help you succeed. Now, today's presenters are Mike Spack and Brian Fiesick. Mike is the creative force and principal writer of the industry Hello. leading on Mike on Traffic. And Bryant over on this side is the vice president of SPAC Enterprise and regularly contributes to the Mike on Traffic as well as co-hosts these webinars with Mike. Both Mike and Brian are licensed professional engineers and certified professional traffic operations engineers. As part of our transportation impact studies, we routinely review site plans. Using our expertise to identify concerns and issues uh, collectively, Mike and Brian reviewed well over 2,000 site plans uh, from locations all across the country. And much like farmers insurance, they know a lot because they've seen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and today's webinar uh, discusses their approach to site plan reviews and will provide several real life examples. With that, I'm turning things over to Mike and Brian. Welcome, guys. All Thanks, right. Paul, and thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, we both wore our plaid today, so we'll get the non-plaid guy out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we'll flip over the PowerPoint now. And get yep. Our... We'll stop that for right now, and we'll move on. All right, so just starting now, we want to talk a little bit about our general process. This is not necessarily a checklist, but it's just how we approach it some of the key things that we start to look for as we go through site plans. So yeah, number the, one. Go. The, yeah, number one is what are the city requirements, whether they're in city ordinances or codes or transportation plans uh, or laws of the state. Just are, yep. is the site plan meeting the legal requirements for ADA and all the other associated <laughs> laws? Pre-talking things a little bit there. Uh, requirements, circulation, then conflicts. So yeah, now, now we'll dive into that. Yeah, now I, so the requirements, yeah, I pre-talked a little bit, but certainly uh, uniform traffic control devices, we don't want purple stop signs inside a parking lot. Nope. Uh, then of course, the different guidances that come across from state regulations and city ordinances. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, obviously any federal, state, county, city, you're looking at all those requirements. What are you required to do while you're out on the side? So it should be pretty straightforward. You either did it or you didn't do it. Yeah. All right, so next one, circulation. So what we're talking about with circulation is we show some handy, dandy graphics here. Uh, basically, we're looking at how do people get into the site? How do they move around the site? Whether you are in a car, a truck, Bus, bike, walking, and, yeah. you know, of course, segways. Segways, and maybe even bird and lime electric scooters yeah. around here. Of, yeah, lots uh, of things we could look at. But it's in general, you're just looking at how do people enter the site? Where do they go from the access? How do they get to the front door? How do they go from a bus stop to the front door? All those yeah. different things that how, you're looking how at. How do the semi trucks or UPS trucks get in for deliveries into loading areas? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're really just looking at all the different conflict points. And this is the fun, creative part of the process is thinking through the engineering. Yep. So again, Mike, jumping ahead with the conflict <laughs> points. So we take our same, uh, we went fancy with the graphics this time take our same vehicles and different things and what we're looking at now, hey, where do they cross? Where are those conflict points? How do we determine, uh, should, do we want pedestrians crossing in front of the cars here? Do we want those trucks going by the bike parking area? All those different things that you're looking for is just 
Where do they cross? Yeah. Where are they in conflict? So when you're working on a Walmart, the loading docks are typically in the back of the building, but if you're dealing with uh, someone a less, little, little less routine than a, a Walmart, figuring out the loading docks yep. and gas stations are just a great example of crossing paths, conflict points of thinking about where that entry, ingress, egress points are can really mm -hmm. change how vehicles and people are moving through a site and getting to the gas pumps and the car wash. Um, and also having sidewalks are important. Right, yeah, it's, it's like Mike said, just trying to review all those. Think of them all as individuals. Where are they going? Um, we've gone so far as to try to draw those paths and just where are they crossing? Do we think that's an appropriate place for them to cross? Yeah, this is uh, still, I'm, I'm showing my age, but this still may be an appropriate place for a few colored pencils and a piece of paper printout of the layout and kind of draw those paths out. <laughs> Don't need to go to it's a very, fancy computer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are the three general categories we look at and we have checklists of detailed things we look at within those um, when we do a site plan review. Mm -hmm. So those, yeah, like you said, we have checklists that build off of them. Those are not uh, per se the checklists that we're looking at here. And you may go into one area more than the other. It really depends on the site. Um, so what we're going to go through now is just going to turn quickly here to some examples. And we'll go through you know, a bunch of comments on each of them. We're not trying to be comprehensive on each of these. We're just trying to give you a flavor of some different sites, some different things we're looking at. Uh, just so you can see how we approach it and uh, what we're seeing as we look at them. So our example number one, uh, larger site, 10 acres, mixed use, retail, office. I think there's a hotel in there as well. So a bunch of different items in there and just put that in some context on a magnitude basis, about 3,500 for that daily trip generation. So about 1750 coming in 1750 exiting over the course of a day. Yeah, which translates to in the order of three, 400 peak hour trips, mm -hmm. um, which definitely is big enough magnitude to need a full traffic impact study. Yep. All right, so as we turn to the site here. Yeah, the, one of the first things that jumps out at us is the internal connection road going through the site, there's good access coming off the local collector and local street there. Um, so we feel there's good circulation here in the site. Yep. Now, obviously, as part of our study, we'd be looking at whether that should be signalized or not. But in this case, we're just trying to focus on the internal right now. And this just this is a good uh, spine road through the site that they have everything else peeling off of. So and, we, we like that idea. And something else to point out, the kind of a theme through these is site designers are very good at ending their design at the boundary of the property. So we will <laughs> always open up Google Earth or the equivalent and lay it out to see what the surrounding area looks like. Too. Yes, very much so. Uh, so if we continue kind of looking off this spine road, one thing you'll note, we've got a couple of restaurants up here. You can see the drive throughs on this one. There is one way in and out of this area. So something we might bring up is can another road be punched in on this side? I mean, we're not, we are talking about an internal road, so another access should be okay. That gives them two ways in and out of these. It also gives a straighter shot to this drive-through. So that might be more appropriate than having them come through and go through a big walking area here. So as we think about those conflicts, that might be one way to reduce some of those conflicts. Right, yeah, clearly with this path, there is conflict between people parking their vehicles and getting mm -hmm. into the site. Uh, something else we would look at if they do plug a road in here, or we can even look at these other ones down here, looking at the separation from the public roads. Yeah. This is where our analysis would come into play. Uh, what's the queuing look like? Uh, how many vehicles are stacked as they're trying to turn out? Are we, are we gonna have internal vehicle conflicts there or are the intersections pretty free? I mean, we'd wanna keep at least 100 feet, uh, maybe more depending on what the analysis says. Yeah, and 
key, our philosophy when looking at things like that is internal to the site, we're more comfortable with kind of things being jammed going outbound as long as it's contained within the site. But if things are really jammed up, it's going to impede the inbound traffic and potentially spill back queues onto the public streets at higher speeds where we could be introducing safety problems. And that's what we want to avoid. On that. That's a good point. Um, another thing, this site up on the north end has a coffee shop and restaurant and uh, out on our blog, we've done a lot of data collection around how long our queues at different uses. So that's something, if you're looking at a use with the drive through check out our data to at least make sure you have a handle on, is there enough stacking area provided? And some cities have that written into their code too, that if you have a drive through you need to provide stacking for X many cars. So that's another requirement to look at. Uh, clearly on this site, they have a lot of space there. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's nice about this is because it is a bigger site with a lot of internal, even if that backs up further, they're backing out into the parking lot. Yeah. So it's the good design there, kind of having them back. Uh, this is a small thing, but as I look at this, you've got a two-way road here their drive through is just offset a little bit, but it, it kind of lines up nicely. So there, there shouldn't be any mistaken uh, you know, wrong way traffic or anything. I mean, it just kind of lines up nicely with traffic. So it's, it's a small thing, but I like it on that side and, and how that lines up with the natural flow of traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing the designers did well with the site is the kind of internal connections into the side, city sidewalks and trails and yeah you can you might be able to faintly see it hopefully you can see it there are outlines along this spine road it's a sidewalk or a trail on either side and the, the city does have the plans there's an existing trail here they want one on this other side too so this would connect nicely into those plans provide access into the site uh, they also have one as we go up to the restaurants, you can see some crossings there, crossings. And so they've clearly thought about how they're going to connect to those trails. Yeah. Yeah. That, <clears throat> the only thing we'd add if we're looking at that is, are there bike racks in front of kind of the higher use? Yeah. If we're going to have kids riding their bikes to a convenience store or something like that, or if it's in a commuter route. Um, and many cities now have ordinances that guide how many bike racks need to be provided, but that's something we check and the site was good. Yep. All right. So that was that one. Let's move on to a second example. <clears throat> yeah, a little bit smaller, uh, five acre site, apartment building, uh, generating about a little bit more than 800 daily trips. So this would be on the bubble of needing an impact study or not. Our rule of thumb is, 100 or more peak hour trips uh, definitely needs an impact study and something in this area is definitely gray area mm -hmm. but this is we believe cities should always be doing a site plan review whether or not an impact study is being done and as we turn to the site plan another thing that drove the need for a traffic study uh, this is a new access that they are proposing to what is a county road on this side so regardless of the amount of traffic with a new access on a higher order road like that, uh, that may be a requirement right there to say, do a traffic study, let's see what those impacts are. Absolutely. Okay, so turning to the site plan, we hinted at it right there, but we have a new access here. So this is one of the things we looked at um, just a little bit of ways away at this intersection, that is a signalized intersection. Uh, as you can see, there's not much spacing there. No. Is there a median down the county road? Nope. It is a two-way center left turn lane. This one turns into the actual uh, left turn lane. So what you are seeing is an access being brought to the edge of the public left turn lane here. So this is one that as we looked at it, we talked with the developer and uh, one, we did not support full access in this location too close spacing, higher order road, too much volume, too many conflicts with that one. So this is on the edge of that site review. It's part of it, it's also part of our analysis. So as we looked at this access, um, and as we took that peak around, 
Up on this side, there's the potential for more development to occur, more redevelopment. So one of our recommendations was to take this driveway and shift it up. So I, if it's not full access, which again, we're recommending restricted, uh, could be right in, right out. We could allow the left in. I definitely don't want those lefts out. So if we're restricting that access, I'm not worried about trying to line up driveways. You can see a hint of a driveway on the other side. Uh, so I like the additional spacing, and then this driveway could also serve this other development in the future if and when that happens. So yeah, we we always try <laughs> in this kind of situation if we can straddle a lot line and get shared access agreements back and forth. Of course, that's a big complicator, but if we can facilitate we can that, do it. We, we sure try to go that path. Yep, definitely prefer it there. Um, another thing to point out is kind of the pickup drop-offs. And as we think more as kind of the Uber robo-taxi kind of world is coming, um, we are thinking more and more about how are people going to get dropped off and picked up in mm -hmm. any kind of development. Um, so as we look over here, there is deep in the site. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I, I don't know that an Uber driver is going to intuitively think that that's the pickup area. Exactly. Um, if we're having an access, and I know you're getting to it, so yeah. pardon my interruption, but you know, as we're looking, really it wants to be kind of in this area. They could come in off this access, do a drop off and either go back out or come back if they're going around. So it, uh, that's where I think it would want to be as opposed to on the backside through multiple turns, twists and turns mm -hmm. through the site. So from that angle, again, another thing we'd bring up, we, as the site reviewers don't have a tremendous amount of control, but uh, definitely we're yep. here to point these things out. Um, so then as we look at kind of the connectivity and sidewalks, um, we they did provide some sidewalks. Um, yeah, but, there's a couple. But there really isn't the intuitive connection out to the surrounding trail system out on the county road. Um, so that's something we'd flag and definitely could be worked on. Yep, and actually with the signal right here, uh, one of our recommendations was to take the sidewalk, bend it around and put it put a crossing kind of diagonal here to get to the signal. So we want to encourage people. Uh, there is some stuff on the other side where people would want to walk. Rather than have them go and have bid block crossings of the county road, if we design the sidewalk and a crossing and get there diagonally, we take them naturally to an easy crossing point. And it would be great if there's more landscaping along the county road to discourage the natural cut through path of mm -hmm. running straight across. So that's balancing act with the design and thinking through more than just traffic is, can we landscape this to guide people to the behavior we want? Exactly. Uh, one last thing we'll point out on this one, I'm kind of circling what would be a big conflict area. We've got people coming in off the public road access to Parking areas on either side, access to a ramp down here, access to a garage. So lots going on in this corner here. Um, we looked at that, there's obviously a lot of conflicts going on. This comes, a couple things come into play here. One, we were looking at, all right, what's the chances, how many vehicles are gonna be going through this at one time? So taking those peak hour numbers, which aren't huge. Uh, so that's a factor as we looked at this area in particular. You're also looking at 90, 95, 99% of the people are going to be going through it every day. So right. and great familiarity with that. Yeah, and we're out, we're out in the suburbs, so very much assume a commuter pattern, heavy out in the morning, heavy in in the evening. So it's not like it's a 50-50 with lots of people back and yep. forth. Yeah. Um, so all those things need to be accounted for. And uh, another item, again, with the potential for development up here, one of the things we recommended, um, there could be a connection, involves some redesign, but there could be a connection here to again, try to connect that up. Uh, we don't want a straight shot through there. There's another road further up there, but if it, um, we want yeah. it to be accessible to the people here, but we don't want it to be a cut through route. So, yeah. so in the end, 
we looked at this and did it raise some concerns? Yes, but we could live with it based on mitigating factors. Yep, and the natural chicane did kind of traffic calming. Traffic calming, yeah. slower speeds, all that. All right, let's move on. To yeah, we, we have four one. queued up, but I don't know that we're going to get to number four. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, site plan number three, uh, 27 acre industrial sites generating 1400 trips, but obviously we're getting into a different animal with an industrial site with the heavy vehicles mm -hmm. um, being a high proportion of the traffic that needs to be accounted for in a traffic impact study and raises some special things we need to look at when thinking about big vehicles moving around the site. All right, so not as clear as I had hoped this would come up, but essentially we have a building on this side, a building on this side, in between our loading docks. Mm -hmm. So this is where your trucks want to go and then parking all the way around the site. And this is a quadrant of a good size interchange um, I believe East River Road's a arterial. Yes, so you can see this is interstate over here. There's actually an exit ramp here, which leads to this arterial. And then off of this, essentially a dead end road provides access to this site and one other site over here. So not a through road here. You're talking about some development traffic. Only. Yeah, it never will be a through road. No. Uh, so what we were looking at for this one, you know, first starting with the access. Again, this one is very close distance to the uh, arterial intersection here. This is one we would review as part of our analysis as well. And a key thing here is what was this stacking back, uh, particularly with the trucks, how many are coming in here. Uh, we talked with the developer, what is the truck movement? Are they expected to come in here? And does that or out, and does that impact the operations? So this, and we flagged this location as a potential concern, again, looking at some of those mitigating factors. Uh, could we live with it if we needed to? Yeah, but then we need to, the next step in thinking about the access to the site, and especially for the heavy vehicles coming in, is looking at turning radius uh, around each mm -hmm. of these corners. And that's essentially a U-turn to use that service road and looked at the truck path there, but then Brian's showing in the middle of the site, uh, once they do get in, if trucks are gonna be using that, that is a very tight driveway mm -hmm. and uh, recommended throwing truck turning radii templates on that and redesigning that driveway to accommodate uh, WB65s, I believe were the design vehicle. I believe so, yes. So that's important to look at those. Um, yeah, I think we can wrap this up, get to the other one too. A couple, a couple other quick ones. Um, they've got this median in the middle over here, two-way traffic on either side. I mean, that's, I guess with the median there, that is kind of clarification rather than just a huge pavement area. But we're just trying to, what are they trying to accomplish here? And is there a better way to do that design? So that'd be something talk with the developer about and see if we can do that uh, see if we any changes we could make to improve that uh, another area yeah that's a big kind of no man's land area We're kind of getting thinking through conflict points um, definitely could they tighten that up a little bit um, either with the buildings themselves or at least paint uh, to kind of delineate paths and uh, one of the last points is this is kind of in the area of a light rail station and there, there's a trail system, bike system, and they did not have trails or sidewalk connections. And could some of their employees be using mass transits? Um, yeah, there's definitely heavy lines on this one. I believe there's a stop at this intersection even. So you're not even, you don't even have to go that far. So there's, there should be some connection to get people back and forth safely, easily, clearly marked, all that sort of thing. Okay. See, that one was easy. We can get to our fourth one here. <laughs> a little bit more fun because there's a lot more going on uh, with this mixed use site, 10 acre site with uh, adding apartments next to a light rail. So transit oriented design. 
um, kind of the same neighborhood part of the city as just the last industrial site. Yep, a little bit further um, north, but same rough area. Yeah, no, a thousand daily trips, but because of the park and ride, heavier in the peak hours than would be normal. I, and thumb. I believe this was for the this may have been for, for the, the apartments, apartments only. So there, there's the apartments and then there's also that component of the light rail. Yeah. Uh, so here we go with the site, just to orient you a little bit. The light rail is up here. They have this apartment building around here, another one over here. And uh, they've got some stuff in here. It's not an apartment, but I can't remember exactly what they have. But a yeah, building here, and I, I don't remember. Were they adding a little retail in here? I think they might. Yeah, I think a lot of the stations in the Twins, yeah. Minneapolis, St. Paul area have a little bit for a dry cleaning and get in coffee Something shop. There. Yeah. yeah, and then another big, larger building on this side. So a few buildings around internal parking, like we said, station tucked up in the corner. So one of the main things that as we were looking at the site, uh, they have these nice little, uh, cul-de-sac looking, traffic circle looking uh, things, but based on their site plan, one would think that they'd have two-way operation going through. And with these kinds of turnarounds, uh, we very much like to restrict them to one-way flow. Mm -hmm. uh, we do appreciate that they have a lot of these drop-off areas, again, for the Ubers and Lyfts and uh, visitors, but uh, we wanted to tighten those up and indicate one-way traffic flow through those circles. And so that'd be putting in some of the regulations. Do they need, do they need the do not enter signs or at least some paint um, just indicating which way that traffic is and try to make it more clear to people as they move to that one way. Uh, kind of related to that, if we look up at this corner, this is a larger drop-off area for the transit station. And you can see that wide driveway, wide access coming in. And this is another one that as, as we look at it, uh, if you're dropping somebody off, you're gonna want the passenger close there. So you, you're gonna want this one way and we don't want people coming the reverse way out. So we recommended, you know, what can we do to make this one way, whether it's shrinking it, whether it's, uh, maybe it's just the entrance that gets shrunk to one lane and then it widens out so people can pull around others that are parked on the side while they let people out. But that's a, that's yeah. a key area that could be uh, improved, uh, one-way entry. Then you don't have people coming out on the curve either. You can get them to a main access point. So Yeah, we, we do like that idea, whether it's for a drive-through at a car wash or a one way like this of really restricting down, narrowing down the entrance, but then flaring back out. So if a car breaks down in the lane that people can get around. Yeah. Or even again, somebody's parked there dropping somebody off. You can pull around them on the side. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Yeah. So that was a major recommendation is get that down to one way. Um, another issue dies on that main street, Northeast, uh, where we show that access in the two driveways. Um, that one, we had to think about that a little bit, that there's conflicting lefts. Uh, yes. If you wanna walk that through with the pointer, Brian. So if I, so this is 60th here, if, I'm, if you're going to turn a left, you're actually passing our new access to turn left. Meanwhile, the opposing one, if you're headed the other way on main to our new access, you turn left that way. So you got two people taking those left turns, they're, they're overlapping lefts. So not ideal from our standpoint. There's another driveway over here, if you think about it, for those two, the lefts occur before they get to each other. So not as big a deal. Um, so this one we thought a lot about with those overlapping lefts. Did we want them to try to move the axis and line them up? Um, yeah, do we need a two-way left turn lane to try to safely handle that? And But kind of with this kind of pattern, it's something to think through and in the queuing analysis, look at it of, yeah. again, just because it's possible doesn't mean it's gonna be a problem. So if it's only gonna happen once or twice a day, 
that's a different order of magnitude than if it's happening 20 times during the peak hour. Yeah, so this is where our analysis really helped out. What's the trip gen? We did counts. We know what was coming out of the other or going in and coming out of the other one. So looking at the analysis, looking at those numbers, those are all things we took into account. And ultimately, um, we were okay with this location. Just the, the chances of those, of those conflicts occurring were pretty small. Yep. So two last points on this as we bump into our uh, finish time is one, TOD site, great sidewalk connectivity, bike racks, all of that. So we definitely looked at it closely, but the designers were in tune with that. And then the last one with apartment buildings, we like to think through the kind of the move-in dates of where are the delivery trucks, the moving companies, mm -hmm. where are they going to park and unload the furniture and all that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we definitely wanted to look at loading dock areas and I believe they were okay on this. Yeah, we looked at some movements around. Could a single unit truck park in here and get their items in and out? So it's it's a little tight, but it can be done. Yep. So again, um, they had some thought to it, even if it uh, could have been a little more spacious for them. Right. So yeah, when you look at delivery trucks again for these kinds of kinds of uses, look at trash trucks. All of those mm -hmm. should be part of your checklist. So with that, now that we're bumping up right to one o'clock, uh, certainly want to say thank you and uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, if you have any follow-up uh, questions, they're mspac at spacconsulting.com. And uh, also, uh, I know a few of you in the survey were interested in help with site plans and we are here to help. Just go out to spacconsulting.com and schedule a time with us. Um, just rifling through our uh, last couple of items. Uh, but why don't we turn it over to Paul and uh, get our faces back on the screen and do a little question and answer time for you. Yeah, so I kind of got right, a lot of questions <laughs> and answers into the sites themselves in terms of a lot of specific questions on each site. One of the big ones that we got a lot of questions on, guys, was site number two. Okay. Oh, let's go back let's to go back site to number it. two, which is interesting <laughs> because it's an apartment building and probably, I think, had the least trip generation. Um, oh, there it is. So one of the things was they asked about was how many turning volumes uh, will it require for an exclusive left turn? Is there any STD available for the driveway turn lanes? How would you distribute the new trips on the north-south directions? And how many driveway entrances will be required by increasing the driveway numbers Will the LOS come uh, with a more favorable income okay. outcome? Okay, I think one, there's a misinterpretation. We weren't proposing a second driveway on the west side, we wanted to relocate that driveway. So it would just still have two driveways. Um, maybe if they punch through on the northwest side by the pet park, they could have a third kind of internal, but we would consider that yeah. much more of a internal yeah, access road. Yeah, that would road. be a connection to a new development up at the top of the page here. Um, so I believe we the trip generation was heavier skewed <laughs> to the southwest out on the mm -hmm. county road naturally with the way the parking ramp was configured. Um, yeah, most people want to get to the county road. They want to even travel towards the top of the page here. Uh, so having a restricted access in this location, um, if it's a three quarter in particular, would allow those lefts in and those right outs to the most heavily traveled way. Uh, we did end up looking at this as a right in right out which then put additional pressure on this intersection and this driveway so that was part of our analysis to look at those different options see what happened ultimately we were okay with the three quarter that's what we recommended again moving that driveway closer to the property line to get more spacing from the signal yeah but again this site I think was roughly in that kind of 100 trips in the peak hour with right. uh, 70 or 80 of them outbound in the morning and back inbound in the evening. So we're not talking Mall of America type numbers <laughs> um, or even at McDonald's that lower volumes and uh, kind of another point with apartment buildings. We definitely like having two driveways on different sides of the building for emergency access. Um, 
So that we wouldn't want to restrict this down to one driveway only. Yeah, and I think that covers something here where someone said it generally inefficient with going to one side of parking. Um, and that connection, was there concerns about uh, that getting worn out if it wasn't paved, uh, wearing out the area and the landscaping and the head connection to the signal? It, Say that again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was some, I think there were some concerns on the connection and it being worn out. Ah, yeah, without had very good point. Without having sidewalks and trail connections, you will end up with a dirt path as people walk those shortest paths. There is a school of thought uh, that I've seen on university campuses and things like that of you actually don't put in any sidewalks or trails. You come back a year later and pave over where those dirt paths were worn in um, instead of trying to force and predict people <laughs> where uh, you people let the people be. show you where they're going. Yeah. So. Um, but we would prefer to guide them here to the signal. Mm -hmm. Going on to site three, because you covered a lot of what some of the comments and concerns was on that with that answer. Okay. All right. Someone had brought up uh, for the access closest to the East River Road, uh, what about a right only with angle truck parking between the buildings and then exiting out the north uh, access? Was there thoughts or considerations on that or why that wasn't done? Yeah, so essentially bring the trucks in here, have them come up, and then they're exiting out the back side. And yes, that's a very good thought. I like that idea. Um, the way the developer ended up wanting to go on this was to bring all the trucks up to the northern ones. So they ended up not even using this as a truck access. That became their employee passenger car. So uh, much faster movement out of the access. Uh, you know, not much queuing on that. All the trucks came on the other side. So that relieved a little bit of the pressure down at this access for us. Yeah, obviously we want to get signs in there and hope that their operations folks, the logistics people are letting this truck yeah. drivers, because mm -hmm. just because a developer says they want it to go that way, uh, doesn't mean it's going to work that okay. way. Uh, one of the things that came out was potentially closing this, so not even allowing the possibility for that. Uh, if you close that off, then all the trucks are forced to come out that other way. So there's there were ideas like that thrown around. We didn't get into every idea, but um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the creative way we should be thinking of these things is okay, if we see an issue, what are several different ways to deal with it? How can we go back to a developer and say, here's an issue, but here's options that we can discuss mm -hmm. and which one would work for your site? Okay. Getting to some general questions here. Um, Jay Jackson says, I really appreciate these webinars. Did you use ITE's trip generates for the estimated daily trip trend or did you use something else? Did you find this method accurate enough? Can you speak to those numbers? Well, and thanks for the question. It almost feels a little loaded in that yeah. uh, most of you hopefully know, but maybe you don't. Uh, go to tripgen.org, T-R-I-P-G-E-N.org. We collect a tremendous amount of trip generation data here in our region and work with partners around the country. And uh, we were the biggest private donor of trip generation data to ITE for the last manual updates. Uh, yep. but, but we look at sites both with ITE rates and we look at it with our own localized current rates. And when we talk through uh, as part of our analysis, uh, which data set we're using, what are recommendations, uh, ITE always recommends going with local current data over their data. Yes. You have it. Yep. So we share that happily. Uh, feel free to go to the, our website, uh, tripgen.org or tripgeneration.org will get you there. Sign up and you'll get a giant spreadsheet with all of our data and summary rates. Yeah. Kind of uh, a little bit off here, but um, someone asked, our fire department requires developments to show 28 feet of curb radius for driveways. It's excessive and in some instances not ideal for pedestrian connectivity. The municipality is now asking for swept pass simulation runs to show correct turn radii depending on driveway width. Do you have any rules of thumb for curb return uh, radii that works for emergency vehicles? I, 
I don't because no. if the intersection is skewed or on a curve, that affects the path. So we go to auto turn uh, every time. And, and it depends out. on what type of vehicle you're looking. Do they need a pumper truck? Do they need a ladder truck? Which depends on the site that you're looking at. Um, um, is it just an ambulance that they're trying to get through? I, I will, Lots of answers yeah, to that. I will nudge back and uh, say back in my city traffic engineer days, we worked closely with the fire chief and got to ride along in the fire trucks. And <laughs> their opinion was, They'll hop curbs. Uh, yeah, they don't need a road. Their trucks are yeah. big and that they'll get to where they need to go. That they prefer us to mark out paths and have some gravel just to provide some stability. But they they had kind of an opposite view of we're going to get there. Um, we don't need everything paved and yeah. smooth. And Well, unrightfully so. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if it's an emergency, I don't care what they're what landscaping they're going over. Please yeah, they're there. going to go over shrubs and everything else. So that might be a conversation. Uh, I, I guess what I'm hearing is different fire chiefs have different points of view on that. Um, and I think I'm totally in agreement that you're really making a poor pedestrian and bicyclist environment for a very rare occurrence that a fire truck needs to get in there. Um, but people are walking there every day. So it's kind of right. getting people out of their myopic viewpoint and talking about the balance of the situation. Another thing to consider for that, if you are running your auto turned is, um, are you trying to keep them in their lane? Because um, obviously take up the whole driveway. They don't need to stay on one side or the other, just they can take up the whole driveway. If off chance that a car is there, they can move out of the way too. So I. You, you should be able to use the whole width and not try to stay in the line. All right, uh, someone has some questions on, si on site four now. Okay. Regarding the restricted left turns, uh, they notice more problems of left across the upper stream approach to an intersection, like the drive across on the proposed drive on the uh, CRE, um, especially if they're crossing multiple lanes like that one. Okay, this one, these are all two lane roads. Yes. So I guess that's a clarification first off is that they're not crossing multiple lanes. Um, we are not fans of four lane undivided roads <laughs> without turn lanes um, and almost always recommend they be restriped with a two way left turn lane down the middle. Um, so does that? I think that would cover that. Yeah. And then yeah. any issues on this site as well with the Northern access being in the middle of the curb on Starlight Boulevard. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, less than ideal, but it is a quiet neighborhood street as you come in there. And it was part of our impact study. Um, yeah, less than ideal, but by making it a one way, yeah. we're, we're comfortable with it. And there was uh, sufficient sight distance. You know, so if somebody's coming this way and entering in, they have good sight distance down. They do have right away as well, so not as much as a concern. Somebody crossing here, they're able to see those cars coming up. And so sight distance wise, yeah, it in, was okay. In a little teaser, we're gonna be doing a webinar next year only on sight distance, but that is a, a huge concern of ours. And a lot of missteps on developments are because nobody's looking at the sight distance at the, the access points. Um, so that's something we look at carefully. Yep. All right, that's all we have guys for the Q&A. Awesome, right. uh, and our next webinar is coming up uh, in brand new 2019. Uh, hopefully you can join us here. Brian's uh, getting in over the slide. We're mid-January going to be mm -hmm. talking about interns and uh, traffic interns and how you can utilize their time and help you think through if you should be lining up trying to hire an intern this spring. So I thought that would be timely as you're planning out your 2019. So hope to see you there. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.